Witnesses on the ground can clearly see Flight 191 flying on its side. We're still turning! Level, baby, level! Brace, brace, brace! Investigators desperately need to know what happened during the final moments of Flight 9633. They catch a break when they learn that an airport security camera off the end of the runway recorded the Yak-42 as it finally lifted off. The grainy image could provide a crucial lead. Whoa, whoa. Can you play that again? The video shows that the plane was properly configured for takeoff. But beyond that, it holds no new information. No clue as to what went wrong. OK, they started here. They lifted off here. The airport runway wasn't the issue. They had plenty of room to take off. They had about 2,800 plus meters of runway available. That's more than twice the distance they should need. Something kept the plane on the ground. The question is, what? They suspect the plane might simply have been too heavy. Aside from being harder to get in the air if you weigh more, and anything that weighs more is going to be harder to accelerate. It's a lesson that was learned nearly nine years earlier in Charlotte, North Carolina. All 21 people aboard a commuter plane died when it crashed and burst into flames less than a minute after takeoff. The plane was 579 pounds above the allowed maximum. Weight was also considered a key factor in the U.S. Army's deadliest peacetime crash. On Aero Air Flight 1285, the weight of 248 soldiers equipped with heavy gear was underestimated. Their DC-8 fell from the sky 2,900 feet beyond the end of the runway in Gander, Newfoundland. Everyone on board was killed. If uh, the weight is underestimated or not calculated at all, you, don't, you just don't have that clear picture of what exactly to expect from the airplane. They didn't know their weight. Concerns mount when investigators learn that Yak service didn't have baggage scales at Yaroslavl's airport. There was no way to weigh the gear, the luggage and the cargo that would be loaded in the airplane, so it was estimated. Investigators estimate the weight of the team and their hockey gear. Ultimately, they find the plane was not overloaded. The weight is under the limit. It may not be the answer, but it provides an important clue. It does not appear that was a contributing issue on this in this case, but it shows that the crew was not properly preparing the information they would need during the takeoff roll. December 28, 1978. We're losing an engine. United Airlines Flight 173 is less than 22 miles from Portland International Airport. The plane's engines are flaming out one after another. With two engines gone, the autopilot can no longer fly the plane. McBroom must get the crippled DC-8 to the airport himself. The engineer struggles to keep the last two engines running. We just lost one and two. Flight 173 has now lost all four engines. With no engines running, backup batteries now provide power to only critical instruments. The 100-ton aircraft is losing more than 3,000 feet of altitude a minute. At this rate, they will be lucky to stay airborne for as long as 90 seconds. Now, Captain McBroom makes a horrifying calculation. I can't make it. The airport is too far away. OK, declare May Day. Portland Tower, United 173, heavy May Day. He was declared May Day. And then in a very, what seemed to me like a, a calm, matter-of-fact voice, I could hear the pilot. 
The engines are flaming out. We're going down. We're not going to be able to make it to the airport. We lost power. We're going down. Emergency services are told what's happening. Flight 173 is flamed out. They're going down. The DC-8 is coming down over a densely populated suburb. Suddenly, Captain McBroom sees what he's been looking for. A dark area up ahead. It looks like an empty field. The place that you want to put it is where there, there's minimum buildings, uh, the most open area possible, because the 200,000 pounds plus jet arriving at 140 knots, which is 160 plus miles an hour, it's going to do a lot of damage to the things on the ground. Putting the plane on this narrow strip of land is McBroom's best bet. But as he gets closer, he realizes it isn't an open field. We can't make it. It's a heavily wooded suburb, and he's headed straight for it. If they're woods and that's all you have, then you're going to have to deal with it. The tops of trees are pretty soft. As you settle into the trees, they get progressively less soft. They're going to do a lot of damage. McBroom doesn't give up. He actually tries to steer the plane between the trees. The passengers still assume that they're about to touch down on a runway. We clipped the top of a few trees, and that felt like we were making the initial landing at the airport. So my first sense was, you know, hooray, we're there. And then all hell broke loose. I saw the bright flash out there and, uh, and knew he had gone down. The plane carves a 1,600-foot-long path through the trees. Incredibly, the DC-8 has crash-landed in the middle of a major American city without injuring a single person on the ground. Most of the 189 passengers and crew are alive, including Captain Malvern McBroom. The jet climbs through a pitch black night. Without a moon to light the scene, it's hard for the passengers to see much of anything out their windows. In the cockpit, the simple turn over the Red Sea is taking a bizarre twist. See what the aircraft just did? Captain Kadir doesn't like the way his plane is behaving. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. Turning right? How turning right? The plane is supposed to be turning left on its way to Cairo. Instead, it's turning in the opposite direction. The captain tries to get his plane back on course, but his situation just gets worse. Knowing he's in trouble, the captain tells the first officer to engage the autopilot. Autopilot! Autopilot! But it doesn't work. The 737 is now flying almost completely on its side. The plane gains speed as it spirals towards the Red Sea. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane is out of control. Diving toward the water, it's traveling at more than 430 miles an hour. Everyone on board can feel the tremendous speed and gut-wrenching turns. The enormous G-forces are making it difficult for Captain Ghadir Abdullah to fly the plane. Ashraf Abdel Hamid, the third member of the flight crew, tells the captain to slow the plane down. Red tar power! Red tar power! Red tar power! The plane is traveling so fast, it's ready to tear itself apart. 
After flying almost upside down, the crew is finally beginning to bring their plane under control. Then they hear the ground proximity warning. They're getting dangerously close to the Red Sea. It's just before five in the morning, minutes after the plane took off from the airport. It's disappeared from local radar screens. By the time the sun rises, the crash site is found, but there's little for rescuers to do. The plane shattered on impact. There are no survivors. All 148 people on board the plane are dead. As the plane climbs to 24,000 feet, the air outside gets thinner and thinner. But the air inside the cabin is pressurized for the passenger's comfort. The difference in air pressure between the cabin on one side of the bulkhead and the unpressurized tail on the other stretches the bulkhead and its faulty repair to the breaking point. In a test which duplicated these conditions, Cracks begin to appear and lengthen around the rivet holes. Until the bulkhead snaps. In an instant, pressurized air from the cabin blows a 30 square foot hole, bringing down the ceiling around the rear toilets. The highly pressurized air blasts its way into the tail fin of the aircraft and simply breaks it off. From that moment on, the plane is doomed. The pilots don't know that most of the tail of their aircraft is missing, blown off into the sea below, along with the crucial hydraulic lines that allow them to control the plane. It all finally makes sense. Without the stabilizing influence of the tail and with the loss of ability to control the rudder and flaps, the pilots cannot control the plane. The giant aircraft now oscillates in a terrifying motion called the Fugoid Cycle. Don't lower the nose! As the nose drops into a shallow dive, the plane gathers speed, which generates lift. The nose rises again, and the plane begins to climb until it loses speed, tips over, and begins to fall again. The whole cycle repeats itself over and over again. Flight 123 is now plunging up and down in terrifying dives, sometimes several hundred feet at a time. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics and their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to, uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could, and hope for some miracle which never occurred. Lower the nose. Lower the nose. Yes. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down. So put the gear down. To understand what the pilots were up against, four hand-picked flight crews were placed in a simulator and confronted with the same situation. Not one of them could land the plane. The pilots of Flight 123 managed to keep their plane in the air for 30 minutes much of it among high mountains. An amazing feat of flying. Back in Tokyo, as the cause of the JAL accident was identified, Ron Schleed had to break the news to his colleague from Boeing, one of the top designers of the 747. The simple truth was that a single row of rivets had been used for the repair when a double row was required. And when we uh, described our findings to him, you can imagine this Boeing man became very, very upset. Uh, uh, personally, uh, was crying because of the fact that his airplane that he designed and then the people that did the repair, because it was Boeing people that designed and did the repair, had made an improper repair that caused the airplane to crash. Boeing's reputation was damaged, but if they could derive any comfort at all from this tragedy, it was that there was no inherent fault in the 747. 
the plane went on to become one of the most successful civil aircraft of all time. The seasoned crew of American Airlines Flight 191 Rudder set. Makes final preparations for takeoff. Spoilers arm. From Chicago's O'Hare Airport. The DC-10's three-engine layout makes it one of the most recognizable passenger jets on the runway. On this flight, a live feed from a video camera mounted in the cockpit allows passengers to watch the takeoff from the cabin. American 191, you are cleared for takeoff. American 191, underway. You have control. I have control. Runway clear? Clear. OK, setting takeoff thrust. Here we go. Damn, there's the turbulence. Not too rough. I've lost power to my side. The captain's instruments suddenly go dead. Looks like we've lost number one. And he's lost power from the left engine. But the plane is already airborne. Look at this. Look at this. Equipment. I need equipment. He blew an engine. The DC-10 should be able to climb with only two engines. Pilots are trained to cope with this kind of emergency. First, they need to get as far from the ground as they can. They put their plane into a steeper climb. Forward speed drops. We're banking. Go right, go right. The plane is banking sharply to the left. It's only 325 feet from the ground. I can't hold it. American 191 Heavy, do you copy? He's not talking to me. Losing power from one engine should not be causing the plane to bank. Passengers have a frightening view of the ground below. What's going on? The pilots can't get the altitude they need, and they're banking further and further to the left. I'm losing it! Go right, go right, come on, come on! 300 feet, we're losing altitude. The cockpit camera gives passengers a glimpse of their fate. But they are not the only ones whose lives are in danger. A trailer park just north of the airport is home to thousands of people. Oh, God. And the plane is heading straight for it. Witnesses on the ground can clearly see Flight 191 flying on its side. We're still turning! Level, baby, level! Brace, brace, brace! The DC-10 crashes into an airport hangar at the edge of the airport. The full load of fuel instantly ignites. DC-10 with 271 souls on board has gone down. Northwest of runway 32 right. American Airlines Flight 191 has crashed just short of the trailer park beside Chicago's O'Hare Airport. The DC-10 has also obliterated a hangar beyond the runway. Once the fire is under control, the search for survivors can begin. All 271 people on board are dead. It's the worst aviation disaster in U.S. history. 